Everyone wants to be understood. And if you, uh, if you want to understand, like, it's surprisingly easy to get people to talk to you. I mean, the thing is that we, we actually are driven by, uh, by an intense political curiosity and by a desire to actually understand what the roots of this crisis are. We, we want to, people to to present their ideas as clearly and coherently as they possibly can so that we can grapple with them. Um, and we don't, you know, just want to turn them into cartoon character stereotypes and catch them in simple mistakes and whatever. And I think people feel that and understand that and respect it. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Woodstock Film Festival's Let's Talk Film podcast. I'm your host, Katie Mejia. Established in 2000, the Woodstock Film Festival is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that nurtures and supports emerging and established filmmakers, sharing their creative voices through the annual festival and year-round programming to promote culture, diversity, community, educational opportunities, and economic growth. So today I'm joined by a very special guest, Oscar-nominated multi-Emmy winning director Rick Rowley. Welcome to the podcast, Rick. Great to be here. So thanks for making time for us today. Um, so your films have won Peabody, Polk, DuPont Columbia Awards and have been honored at festivals worldwide. Your Oscar-nominated feature, Dirty Wars, from 2013 was the culmination of 10 years as a war reporter in Iraq. Afghanistan and the lesser known battlegrounds of America's war on terror. Since then, Rowley has turned his lens on our domestic political war on terror. Some of his recent directing credits include Emmy winning investigative thriller, Kingdom of Silence, which was on Showtime, 16 Shots, also on Showtime, which won an Emmy and Television Academy honors for its unflinching look at the police murder of Laquan McDonald and the cover up that followed. So first off, thanks again for joining us. Um, you know, we usually kick off the podcast talking about a recent screening um, that the Woodstock Film Festival has put on. And we were honored to have Ithaca, the documentary that is about the fight to free Julian Assange. Back in April, we were able to screen that. And you were there with Julian Assange's father, a very humble, graceful man, and his brother, also equally humble, and you were able to share in the Q&A um, something that was very timely as it was, I think it was the 13 year anniversary of when you yourself were in Iraq and you were a part of what was happening there. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I was in Baghdad, um, unembedded on July 12th, 2007. Uh, and this was a very bloody, violent period of the war when Almost no journalists were living outside of the blast shields in the green zone. But but I was with a small group of other other war reporters and we were out filming. And then when we came back in the evening, we heard about this attack and that one of our colleagues had been killed. So first thing in the morning, we raced out to the site um, and uh, I think it was in Baghdad, Jadid. And um, the uh, you know, we filmed the the mangled wreckage of this van. Uh, we filmed the blood soaking into the sand. We interviewed a dozen witnesses um, and we called the US military for comment on it. And we knew, you know, we knew we had no story because, um, you know, all of these witnesses, because they were Iraqi, their, their words and their statements, um, you know, carried less weight in the American media than a two line um, statement from the press office of the of the uh, multinational forces there. So um, we couldn't we, we couldn't report on it, and that footage just sort of sat there. It wasn't until WikiLeaks released uh, the collateral murder video, which was a video that Chelsea Manning leaked, uh, which is uh, the cockpit video from an Apache attack helicopter, where you hear the uh, you hear and you see um, the soldiers opening fire on a group of civilians, including you know, a, a Reuters journalist, but also a father and his son who are there trying to help some of the wounded after the attack happens. Um, it was uh, because WikiLeaks was there, because Chelsea Manning was brave enough to leak this footage that it was possible to even speak about the things that we knew were true about this war. Um, and then that became 
reality over and over and over again that you know that it wasn't that people on the ground didn't know the reality of what was happening it was that we could not report it because uh without the kind of evidence uh that um that the leaks that wikileaks provided um you know uh, allowed us to do so you know it was a war built on lies um that continued to sustain itself on lies that ended with lies and wikileaks was um a platform through which you could, you know, hear the truth in the middle of that. And so that is why I'll forever be grateful to, to Julian. Yeah. And Chelsea Manning, I mean, they're, they're the whistleblowers that come out with this information and risk their life, you know, that documentary was really, really hard to watch, but also beautiful. And I highly recommend people go watch Ithaca. I think it's now broadcasting on the UK television. With a film like that, you've got the documentation of a person who, you know, basically he gave his life away, you know, for us to be able to have our free speech. And so if you watch the film, it's, you know, it's about his father, his brother, his wife and his children. And that's the question I also have for you. I mean, how are you able as a journalist to go into these dangerous places? You know, when you have family and you have people, you're really risking it all. Um, what gives you that calling? Is it is that your sort of just like your soul, you know, soul's purpose? Or is it more than that? I mean, the first thing to say to those kinds of questions always is that, you know, the risks that we take as international journalists who go in to cover one of our wars are, are nothing in comparison to the risks of the people we work with in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan or Yemen and Somalia. I mean, we, we you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Iraq and a lot of time in Afghanistan and elsewhere, but, um, but I leave, you know, and I go home. And um, many of the people we work with can't, can't do that. After the fall of Kabul, we worked hard to try to find a way to get one of our one of our fixers like out of out of Afghanistan. And we, we managed to in the end, but um, but that's just, you know, that's just one person. So anyway, I mean, we need to take the risks that are that, that Western journalists like like myself take, you know, um, take those in context of the broader, you know, risk and suffering in the war. I was I was willing to take kind of stupid risks to cover the war in Iraq because I felt like I felt like I had been made an accomplice in a massive global crime. <clears throat> I mean, I feel like in a thousand years, we as a country won't be forgiven for what we did to Baghdad. That Baghdad, a cosmopolitan center for centuries, was reduced to a cluster of walled ghettos armed against itself. Um, that, you know, the birthplace of the written word, um, the birthplace of agriculture, um, reduced to starvation i mean um filming you know kids children shitting themselves to bed with to death with cholera in refugee camps um and the whole the whole civil society and structure of the country destroyed and plunged into into civil war by um by our invasion i mean that was something that um i felt um i felt in one way impotent to stop, but um, compelled to to do the only thing I knew how to do, which was to to film it and to and to make films out of it. That's the beauty of art, right? You can have that little bit of self-expression so that people know. I mean, nobody would have known about it if it wasn't for a lot of the things that are happening, if it wasn't for your films and for films like Ithaca. You know, I knew about Julian Assange and I knew about what had happened there. Um, but we forget, you know, after all this time, you know, we forget. And that's my other question for you is what do we do about the these war crimes that have not been dealt with? Um, that there's this sense that we kind of just move on from things and not really deal with them. How do you yourself deal with that every day, knowing that these things were not punished, that they're just going on unpunished? I mean, I think we as a nation carry this around with us, like whether we acknowledge it or not. You know, one of the things, I mean, I, I spent like a decade covering um, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. And, um, and I noticed during that period of time that soldiers from those wars that I was covering were coming home and they were joining right-wing militias uh, in record numbers. And that there was a way in which 
these two failed wars, the, the poison from our crimes there was seeping into the soil here. And that, uh, you know, the, the rise of the far right today and the way American politics has been distorted um, and, and poisoned is part of the reckoning for our wars overseas. We think maybe by ignoring these things and pretending they're not going to touch us, uh, that we can escape them, but we can't. That guilt is in us and, and, we, and we feel it and we, we carry it. I started making films in conflict zones when I was 19 and I was covering uprisings and revolutions in Latin America and elsewhere. When you're young, you're, uh, you feel like nothing can touch you, right? Um, and when you're a filmmaker, you feel like nothing can touch you. You feel like, you know, looking through this lens, the camera between you and the world outside absorbs the, the pain and the trauma that could touch you. Um, and I felt that way um, uh, for a long time, all the way, I mean, up until I was, I was filming in, in Jenin in Palestine in 2001 when the refugee camp was destroyed. And, um, and I was in a market when tanks came in and opened fire. And I filmed this five-year-old girl who was shot through the arm with a 50 caliber round and her, her bone shattered. And I jumped in the ambulance with her and, um, and then I followed her to the hospital and, and she bled to death. And I filmed her um, bleeding out on a, in a, in a hospital on, on a bed. And, um, and I, um, and then I, and I was fine. I filmed it. I filmed her father crumbling in front of me. I went out and I filmed the children running out into the street with stones, chanting the names of their dead brothers and sisters. And I thought I was fine. I cut it, came back to New York, cut it into a reel. I was, and it wasn't until I went up on stage and I, I put the tape in um, and started to introduce it that I, um, I burst into tears and I couldn't speak. It, it wasn't until that moment that I realized um, that all of that, uh, all of that had touched me. Um, and, um, and so, you know, a lot of, uh, and it, it went through a very hard time. I mean, a lot of people who do this stuff go through difficult times. Some people um, never, never come back um, in, in all sorts of ways, physically or mentally or in other ways. Um, but I was very lucky to be surrounded by supportive people in a world in which I felt um, like, like I wanted to survive it all and that it was important to have a purpose in the middle of it all. You know, I also think about Baghdad and Iraq and Mesopotamia and, and the incredible history there that was destroyed and just keep wondering, when is there ever going to be kind of justice? Um, because we just, we don't know what happens with the war machine. We just see it on the news and we're just taxpayers that are literally contributing to it and we can't really do anything about it. And it feels very, I feel powerless, but when I see your films and I see some of the things you're doing, you know, it, it, it empowers me. And, and same with Ithaca, you know, it was hard to watch that film. It was very hard to be in a theater with a lot of people together watching it. Cause I felt like half the audience was like holding back tears but I think that that's the beauty of film when you're together with people and you can talk about it, you know, um, because that way you could sort of express these things that you're holding, you're holding inside. Um, but I did want to switch gears a little bit. So talking about, I just wanted to know what you thought on, um, cause you did say you wanted to talk about sort of the evolution of documentary films, a documentary, like your documentary that won all those awards. that was just absolutely amazing. Dirty Wars. That was out in 2013. What's the difference between 2013 and 2025? How do you see, you know, the, the, the change in documentary filmmaking? The, the evolution over our lifetime of the uh, of the technologies and then you know of the aesthetic it's it, we've gone through completely different worlds i mean just the the first film i made was a, about the zapatistas back in 1995 90, and you know we had the first digital video cameras that were available at the time were the sony vx 1000s and they shot standard definition which is like you know 700 by 400 pixels these tiny little tiny little square um, and, you know, no depth of field, right? Like, or, or I mean, infinite depth of field, no, no shallow focus, no texture, no depth to the image. And so an aesthetic grew up around that kind of video uh, that was 
where you use layering and you know use layers and effects and you would build you'd build these sort of collage visual collages to create the density and texture that you could get in that you didn't have because you weren't shooting on 16 or 35 and we were you know elaborating a completely new and exciting kind of um uh, you know, new film style. Um, and then, uh, and then high definition came out, consumer high definition came out when I was in Iraq in, you know, around 2005, 2005, I think six is when the first uh, consumer high def cameras came out. And it was a totally different world. You suddenly had the ability to hold more than one thing in the frame at a time and foreground and background. And it, it led to, I mean, the, non-linear disjointed spiraling kind of structures of you know the most interesting experimental uh, and, and avant-garde documentary of the pre-2000s era was like replaced instantly with um with a you know an aesthetic that had depth and surface in it like that was built out of hd and the the de you know the uh the cameras are just getting better the sensors are getting more powerful, the grain tighter, the depth, like uh, more visceral. And so now, you know, it's reached a point where, where before, you know, the, the sort of shaky digital aesthetic where you felt like um, you felt like what was being transmitted was not the object in the frame, but the frame itself. Like the idea was that you were the cameraman or camera woman running through the street, not the person inside the frame. Uh, which created a you know super energetic, interesting kind of look. Now uh, the the subject is is framed, is on the proscenium inside the frame, uh, and it uh, those are the um, the cameras have moved back and shot longer, and it creates a you know has created a whole new sort of style of of making these films. Um, at the same time, the the market for documentary has exploded in a completely unimaginable way i mean when we started making films there was no you didn't think documentary filmmaking wasn't a career like you wouldn't make money at it <laughs> you know you'd um you'd uh, you'd make one if you really really cared about it and maybe make another but like um uh and and it wasn't uh and because the budgets and everything were so small everyone did everything right a director was also the camera uh, operator and also the producer and did the sound and did the editing and the whole thing was um you know was not professionalized now we have a highly professionalized documentary world where you go and study to be just an editor or just a cinematographer the idea of coming of being a documentary cinematographer and not a director was i mean maybe there's one or two people in America who could do that, unless you're just shooting news, you know, like something totally different. Anyway, so the the universe uh, has evolved dramatically and it's, and it's changing again, like right now, like the end of the, the end of the streaming boom, right? Has happened, is happening like right in front of us. And now the, it feels like the world is going back into a moment of kind of um, of tightening around the documentary market where, uh, where again, it'll become necessary to operate as smaller kind of teams. You did get a, a Peabody award. I don't know if you're interested in talking about that, but the, the Peabody, Peabody award was for a frontline piece. Um, do you want to kind of expand more on that piece? Yeah, totally. So si since Dirty Wars, I've, you know, come back and been making films about domestic political nightmares. And so I, I um, made a couple of series and have been doing, you know, feature docs um, like, you know, the ones I've done for Showtime and a current uh, doc I'm doing for HBO, but also I've been working with Frontline. Um, and I've, I've been making a series of docs for them about the rise of the far right in America. Um, I think I made six or seven of them so far. And, um, and it's a, it's a longitudinal project, um, right? I mean, these are working for frontline is great. Um, it, it's a, it's totally different than working in the sort of the, the rest of the feature doc kind of world, um, uh, where you, 
you know, spend two or three, or in the case of this Border Patrol film, like four years working on a thing to be, uh, to have a certain kind of shape. You're working much faster making films that are supposed to engage immediately with audiences. And Frontline has a huge audience. You know, when these films premiere, there are 2 million viewers see them uh, on the, the Tuesday that they come out and they have, you know, an impact that is immediate and visceral. So covering the far right felt like, it felt like coming back from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that this was an issue that had a kind of urgency that demanded um, immediate engagement. I made a film about the Bundy uprising when it happened in Nevada and in Malia, the two uh, Bundy standoffs. Um, I made a film uh, about Charlottesville, um, then, you know, several others a film about that, that led up to January 6th. And then this most recent film about um, General Michael Flynn, uh, which who just won the Peabody this year. And it's amazing. So the film about Charlottesville aired and I, I got a phone call like the next week from uh, the US attorney in Virginia um, telling me to come down to Charlottesville the next you know Thursday uh, and be in court at 10 a.m. Um, so I went down there and he announced from the podium that They'd arrested every single member of this uh, this neo-Nazi fight club that we'd exposed in the um, in our front line. And from the stage, he you know acknowledged that it was our reporting that led to these investigations and these arrests. So that's a a kind of immediate impact that is you know that you get at a place like Frontline that you don't necessarily get if your doc is on premium cable, you know. Well, it's, um, like, it's like it's like WikiLeaks. I mean, there's the, people say we live in a post WikiLeaks world. Like, there's no more of that sort of happening, and the, the sort of the immediacy of people seeing things. I mean, there's some things, but they're more controlled. That was when it was like totally no one could control it. The right or the left or whoever's running things couldn't control it. And now it's like okay, well, thank God there's still something like Frontline because I do feel like Frontline is that place where you really get amazing reporting that will immediately have an, a resonance. So that's amazing. You get to, you're doing six, you did six episodes and you're going to continue with that series. Yeah, no, I'm continuing like this. Uh, we're, I'm on this beat and covering the story. Um, like, where... And it's just ongoing. It just keeps going. You don't have a limit. To, it's not like 10 episodes you're doing. You just kind of keep following as it's going. Yeah, yeah. It's a multi-year longitudinal project. And at this point, I mean, we've we've covered in these pieces like the the far right or the rise of the far right in um, in a more in-depth and nuanced way than it would be possible to do almost anywhere. Right. I mean, from, you know, militias in the inner mountain west to like Proud Boys in January 6th to, um, you know, neo-Nazi terrorist cells trying to blow up nuclear power plants to, uh, you know, the Boogaloo movement, I mean, there's, um, it It allows you to get a kind of depth uh, to your analysis if you get to, if you stay, are allowed to stay on the beat for that long. And, so and then, how do you get access to, I mean, how do these people trust you? I mean, this is a question that all filmmakers have, like, how do you get your, how do you get access? How is it done with this particular group of people? Like, how are you able to kind of get in there and get stories and, and get access? Well, I mean, it, it's incredibly difficult. It has never, I think, been harder. Well, in my lifetime, it's never been harder to be a journalist, um, you know, anywhere. I mean, it's never been more dangerous um, in, you know, Ukraine or Syria or Mexico or wherever. Uh, there's never been a more antagonistic environment in uh, India or in the US or in Russia or in Turkey. Um, and, uh, you know, when we are out filming in the street, it's never been more polarized where people just assume that you're the enemy because you've got a camera. So it's incredibly difficult. It's incredibly difficult to do any any of this job anywhere. But inside uh, far right groups or, or any kind of group like that, I mean, the thing is that we we actually are driven by by an intense political curiosity and by a desire to actually understand what the roots of this crisis are and what it is that is motivate mo like mobilizing and guiding this ascendant movement we we want to, people to to present their ideas as clearly and coherently as they possibly can so that we can grapple with them um and we don't you know just want to 
turn them into cartoon character stereotypes and catch them in simple mistakes and whatever. And I think people feel that and understand that and respect it. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you, everyone wants to talk to at the end of the day, like everyone wants to be understood. And if you, uh, if you want to understand, like it's surprisingly easy to get people to talk to you. I think it's also your personality. You just have like that down to earth, humble gracefulness that people want to speak to you and you're, you don't put on that sense that you want to maybe exploit them. Right. And so they're willing. And like you said, they do want to talk, but I think it also depends on you, your personality and how you present it, you know? And so that's probably why just even talking to you right now, I can see that you have that ability to, you, you kind of like trust, you're trustworthy. You have this trustworthiness to your, to to your personality and your energy. And that's probably why anybody would want to share, you know, um, but most people are still like afraid, you know, it's, it's, you're, you're putting me in this really, you're putting me in a box, they would say, you're putting me in this left or right box or whatever. And so they might still be, be, I would think it would still be ext extremely difficult, but then it's also about the camera. Everybody knows nowadays, like I myself also, you can't shoot anything anymore. People are like, Oh no, you have to have 15,000 documents because people are afraid that they're going to be exposed or something, right? Or there's going to be a lawsuit or whatever. And so because of social media, it's so hard to do anything anymore. I mean, I remember back when you could have a GoPro camera kind of like hidden and people wouldn't know that you were filming or whatever, not, you know, to say that you don't, you want to do things without people's permission, but it is a lot harder. I mean, I can only imagine your job. I, I, I'm just absolutely blown away that, you know, war reporting even still happens, you know? Um, so do you see yourself after doing the frontline piece that's more localized? Do you see yourself continuing the war reporting? Because I mean, right now, there's still that constant war. There's never, I, I, I'm trying to think there hasn't been a very long period of time where there hasn't been some sort of war going on where they're taking our tax dollars and it's going to this country, it's going to this country and, and weapons are being sold. I mean, I think it's like this constant selling of weapons is what, props up the United States. And, and it's, you just kind of wonder, is there, do you see us in a peaceful time? I mean, do you see when you don't, won't have a job to go and do war reporting? Do you think we will kind of ever get to a point in our lifetimes of not having some sort of war, war conflict happening? I mean, I hope so, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, there's, the U S is, is involved in hot fighting conflicts like all over all over the world right now and in simmering cold conflicts that are teetering on the edge of like shooting wars and, and even more. Dirty Wars sort of laid out kind of a, a map of this. I mean, we have right now covert operations going on in, you know, in Yemen, in Somalia, all across the Horn of Africa and West Africa. Um, uh, in Central Africa, <laughs> we have operations, operators working in the Philippines. I've been doing, I've been focusing on the far right for a long time in the US. And really, there are two things that are driving it, its rise. There is a, a long legacy in history and there is a permanent, probably sliver of the population that is un, unredeemably racist, maybe, and just committed to these kinds of thoughts. But like, there's a vast, vast reservoir of populist anger in America that is being channeled right now by the right and not by the left. And that anger is being fed more than anything by two things. First, by the levels of inequality that we've reached in the United States that are greater than we've seen any time since the Gilded Age. That compounded by three million Americans returning from two failed wars overseas, wars that were built on lies, wars that that everyone now recognizes were not only failures and defeats, but were also pointless, worse than pointless, were criminal. Three million Americans risked their lives and killed to prop up brutal, hated regimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they, they know it. And they know that they were betrayed by their government. And they're coming back to a, to a country in which they have no future and in which the towns they grew up in, in rural America, have no future. Those are powerful underlying forces that demagogues on the far right and movements on the far right are able to organize and channel to their own ends because no one else is. Grappling with those two things, with the massive inequality in America and with our unending militarism overseas, are, if we don't 
come to terms with those things, we will never going to cure the sicknesses that plague our country now. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have, you know, human beings and they've been wronged. We've all been wronged, whether you're right or left or in the middle or black or white or a woman or a man or whatever. We, we have these experiences and we you know, need to understand. And so that's why journalism and films like yours, that's why it's so important. And, you know, keep doing the work you're doing. I know it's hard. I, I feel it's it's just such an honor to talk to you, to be able to share these stories with you. And I did want to just close it out with sort of one final question, how we usually close out the podcast. Why do you think independent film and, and in journalism too, independent, like not, you know, funded by lots of money in the mainstream media or large corporations. Why do you think that's so important? One of the things that being in Iraq made clear is that media is a weapon of war. You know, I mean, we saw that war filmed from the noses of bombs and narrated by generals. Um, we, the cameras were embedded with American soldiers and rode on the back of tanks. We never saw the cameras on the other side of that entire media and military apparatus filming with with Iraqis, with the people who lived the experience of the war. And so we never learned the truth of that war as a country, right? I mean, most of the truths of war are not learned by invading armies. I mean, the most important choice you make when you're making a, a documentary film or any kind of film is choosing where you're going to stand. Um, and having the freedom as an independent to go where where you believe the heart of the story and of the country lies and, and choose where you're going to stand and film is totally precious. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate it. So that's it for this episode of the Woodstock Film Festival Let's Talk Film podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the like button and all of that. Follow us on Instagram, Woodstock Film Festival. And we'll see you next time. 